Pedro. So let's first talk about some preliminary steps in self-realization. I hope most of you are familiar with Bhagavad Gita, where Krishna presents the ABCs in the second chapter especially. Why should you be so concerned with your body? When you talk about the body, as Krishna does from the very beginning of Bhagavad Gita, you're really focusing on senses. Actually, the body is a bag of senses. I wonder if you ever thought about it like that. Krishna explains that lowest on the hierarchy of existence are the sense objects. So please visualize how with each one of your senses, you're grasping, you're seeking, you're grabbing sense objects, whether for the eyes, the ears, the nose, the tongue, or the sense of touch. That's what makes life for us, sensory activity. And of course, there is the mind, Bhagavad Gita, will teach you that the mind is like the sixth sense. It grabs things, it feels things, it turns them around upside down. So your life is all about senses. But people lacking this knowledge of Bhagavad Gita just focus on the body as if the body is just a sack or a block of ice. And then they carry that misconception into trying to understand spiritual existence. They think, well, there's this body, and they don't think about senses, although they're so attached to sensory activity. And then when they consider spiritual life and spiritual existence, they don't see a role for senses. So you know what that means. If there's no role for your senses in spiritual existence, why give up material existence? Because material existence is full of sense activity. So in a nutshell, I hope I've explained to you the necessity of bhakti yoga. It teaches you, first of all, to deal with ground zero, your material existence. It's all about senses, chasing sense objects. And there's a kind of yearning, burning for your senses to hook up with the sense objects. And that is the story of our material life. Whether you're an infant, young, middle-aged or elderly, it's all about sensory activity. How can I have a pleasing sensory experience, right? I want to be entertained. My mind needs to be entertained. I want pleasant sensations, tasty stuff for the tongue, fragrant aromas, attractive aromas, sounds that are fulfilling and nice sensations for the skin. And that supposedly makes your life complete. It's not just the body that's involved with material life. There's also the mind. And with your mind, what do you do? Actually, it can be said, and the Bhakti Yoga Wisdom does say it, that material existence is predominantly experienced through the mind. We're always making plans for sensory gratification. We're always making plans for experiences that will please us. And so much of that mental functioning is about anticipation, right? In fact, anticipation is 90% of the sensory engagement. 
What does that mean? That you build up in your mind so much mm, forward thinking. Oh, I'm going to do this. It's going to taste like this. It's going to feel like this. It's going to be good. Or at least it'll be better than being bored the way I am now. It'll be something. This is all going on in your mind, right? Most of your so-called happiness is just about anticipation. And it's amazing. We never give up. Even though we're frustrated by our pursuits of so-called happiness, we just can't let it go because our senses need activity. So our first step in dealing with reality Coming out of La La Land, our first step is to recognize the body means a bag of senses. And with that collection of senses, we seek gratification. And we also seek to push back any distress. So this becomes the story of our life. Attracting happiness grabbing happiness, and beating back distress. And people say, that's life. What do you think? Is that all there is to life? Just trying to grab temporary happiness and trying to beat, beat off distress? Unfortunately, we live in a consumer society that strips life of all its higher values higher aims, higher destinations. So here we are in the big city of New York, city of my birth. I remember living in here. As a little child, I grew up in Queens when there were forests and dirt roads in Queens. I don't think anyone here remembers that. Springfield Gardens. Dirt roads and forests all around the house. I could just go in the forest and play. This was New York City. <laughs> On one side of the house where I spent my childhood, there was a big empty meadow. Trees and grass. Across the street was a big forest. So the little kids could just roam throughout the neighborhood freely with no, the parents weren't concerned. Why? Because all the fathers were at work and we were all the mothers at home. So you couldn't do anything naughty in the neighborhood. Even if you went three blocks this way, three blocks that way, if you tried to do something naughty, some mother would report you to your mother. Of course, things aren't like that anymore. I remember once my brother and I, I was, I must have been six years old and he was four and a half. We came up with a great idea in Queens, Springfield Gardens. We decided, it was Christmas time, the weeks leading up to Christmas, and all the houses had Christmas lights around the doors. Do they still do that? Yeah. Well, back then, this is the 50s, so everything was quite conservative. So every house had Christmas lights around the door, the front door, and often around the front windows, too. So my little brother and I thought it would be great to go to each house in the neighborhood, unscrew the Christmas light bulbs, and smash them on the front steps. <laughs> We thought the sound that was made when the, the bulbs hit the pavement or hit the front steps, it was so fascinating. So we went through about four houses like that before the word went out. <laughs> and our mother was informed, and of course she warmed our bottoms a bit. <laughs> so I used to think, New York is the greatest place. In my formative years, 
if not going to school in New England, I was living in Manhattan, 90th and Central Park West. And so, when I heard how devotees, especially Srila Prabhupada, his divine grace, my spiritual preceptor, when I heard them criticize New York, I was bewildered. <laughs> I thought it was the greatest place in the universe. <laughs> so here I am back in New York again and here you are so you may be wondering where would I be going and I'm wondering where you would be going <laughs> what do you plan as your destination bhakti yoga is very destination conscious how many of you would board any airplane at LaGuardia or Newark Airport or JFK without caring where it's going? No, you catch a particular flight to get to a particular destination. So similarly with your life. How can we live life without a particular destination in mind? But in a high-pressure consumer society, industrialized, militarized consumer society that we have, it's all right. It's cool even just to live without knowing where you're going. Maybe some of you still do that. Although I suspect because you're coming here, you have some concern. Maybe material happiness isn't all that it's supposed to be. And maybe we should be concerned about our future. Often persons say, I don't worry about the future, especially what comes after old age and death. Whatever happens, happens. The universe will take care of me. I've tried to be good. I mean, I've walked a few ladies, old ladies across the street. I've done some good deeds, surely. The universe will take care of me if there is something after death. We claim to be so casual and carefree about our entire future. You see, from the bhakti yoga point of view, the future doesn't simply mean when this present body is finished. Many of you know Krishna's famous explanation in the second chapter of Bhagavad Gita. Just like the infant has a future to become a young child, the young child has a future to become a teenager, the teenager has a future to become an adult, the adult has a, a future to become an elderly person, the elderly person has a future to abandon that body, to die. But for one who has died, there's also a future. So that's Krishna's logic. For one who has taken birth, death is certain, and for one who has died, birth is certain. So the intelligent person is concerned about my future beyond this present body. Now some will object to this. Maybe some of your own friends and relatives would object. They say, before birth there was nothing, a huge infinite expanse of nothingness, and after death there'll be just another huge expanse of nothingness. So basically your life is just a speck sandwiched by infinite nothingness on both sides, bookends on both sides. What do you think? Before your birth, you don't remember anything. Why should you remember? There was nothingness. You, there was no existence. After your death, there's also nothingness. So don't worry about trying to find some deep meaning to life. You are just a speck in an ocean of nothingness, meaninglessness. What do you think? Can you live your life like that? No. <laughs> but 
people do. Not you, but people do. They're convinced that the body is a machine, and when the machine breaks down, that's the end of you, because you are the body. So what to do about trying to live on a higher level? We need better knowledge. We need higher knowledge. And that will allow us to make a significant change, a significant transformation with our life. We're suffering actually because of ignorance. Now what does it mean to be ignorant? I remember when I I was not a teenager, but maybe eight or nine or ten years old. If you really wanted to criticize another kid in a very sharp way, you would say, you're just being ignorant. <laughs> and of course, the other kid would just slough it off. Like, what does that mean anyway, ignorant? <laughs> so you could feel that you were superior because you could use a big word like that as a little kid. You're acting ignorantly. You're ignorant. <laughs> and you, then you watch the other kid scratch his head like, ignorant. What, what, does, what does that actually mean? How does that relate to, to me, the, the kid's trying to figure out? <laughs> but ignorance, is a, it's for real. For those of you who have read Bhagavad Gita, I hope that you are... I hope that you have turned to Srimad Bhagavatam. And there in the first canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, you have a statement by Queen Kunti, a most enlightened lady. And I say this Sanskrit because it helps me to remember it in English. Bhavi smen krishamananam avijja kama karmavi. What's causing our struggle for satisfying the senses, which include the mind? What's driving us onward in this futile pursuit? Okay, we get a little bit of so-called happiness. But from the bhakti yoga point of view, you're meant for much more than a speck of happiness. But we get bought off so easily just by a, a few magic moments in, in fact, this whole concept of a magic moment is so tragic. Human life has, sh its purpose, its glory has shrunk to just this magic moment. So Queen Kunti explains that there's a very difficult struggle going on as we try to make our way through this world and get what we want and avoid what we don't want. So where does this struggle, and or how does it originate? Avidja, that means ignorance. First there's our taking shelter of ignorance. And then from that contact with ignorance, we take on ignorance. Next comes karma desire for the material. You can't have a desire for the material unless first there's a massive ignorance. First you have to be covered by a dark cloud, by fog, and then you manifest all kinds of artificial desires. So if you want to trace the origin of your material desires, you'll find the source in ignorance. So first ignorance, then these artificial or material desires, and then karma, material activities. We're active materially to fulfill our artificial or material desires. And all this can be traced back to avidja, ignorance massive cloud of ignorance that we've taken shelter of and therefore we're so bewildered. What do I do? Who am I? Am I this body? 
Am I the mind? Am I something beyond the body and mind? Or maybe I'm nothing at all. And maybe there's nothing before birth and nothing after death. And so in this vast, cold, and indifferent universe, I should just make my own purpose, make my own light, shine my own light. What do you think? That's, that's considered to be very valiant today. Make your own purpose. Do not allow your life to be defined by some external entity. Especially God. God forbid. <laughs> Stand on your own two feet. Make your own purpose. Be self-defining. And then you'll be happy and successful. What do you think? It turns out that laboring under this misconception, this hallucination, people are cracking up. Look at the rates of anxiety disorder and depression soaring in the USA and other first world countries, which supposedly have it all. It's hard work. It's excruciating work trying to define your own purpose all on your own. It sounded cool at first. Yeah, I make my own standards. I make my own... I judge myself. I listen to no one else. If I make a mistake, so what? I forgive myself. That's all that matters. Me. What I want and what I consider to be purposeful. It seems so attractive to live like that. But look at the result. People are literally cracking up. They can't handle it. So this is what Queen Kunti means by the struggle. Bhave Smen Krishamananam. The struggle in the world of Bhava. What is the world of Bhava? Bhava means what becomes and unbecomes. Bhava Sindhu. The bhakti of terminology is very fascinating. So Sindhu means ocean and Bhava means becoming and unbecoming. So we're drowning in an ocean of becoming and, un and unbecoming in our foolish quest for temporary fulfillment. And what's the origin of that quest? Ignorance, avidya, recovered by a dark cloud of illusion. And then, once we're covered in that way, artificial desires sprout in us. I will be happy in this way. I will be happy in that way. Everyone else looks happy. Why not me? I've got to get my share. Okay, there'll be some bad times, some ups, some downs. That's okay. I've got to get my share of fulfillment. I know it's out there, right? It's waiting on me. <laughs> so where was I talking about the pressures of time. Hmm, where have I been? Ah, Atlanta, Georgia, a few days ago. <laughs> it took me a while to remember. The topic was fear. Conquering fear or being conquered by fear. So I explain that in the material conception of life, Fear plays a dominant role because of time. You're afraid of time, but we won't admit that to ourselves. Time spoils everything. So therefore, we feel that we, we've got to score before the game ends. We've got to find fulfillment. We've got to express ourselves before time takes everything away. So this is fear. We may present ourselves as upbeat and confident. I know what I'm doing. I've got career plans. I've got investment plans. I've got relationship plans. Yeah, life's at my fingertips. But you know how that works. In a moment, there can be complete upheaval. Just like everyone's been through the pandemic. No one 
expected that. Yeah, a few experts had predicted it. Very few, but 95% of the people were caught totally off guard. So that should make us think. Our life is very precarious. But when we realize life is precarious, very delicate and fragile, you can go one or two ways. And this will be the last point I explain. You can use that temporariness of material life to push you forward to a spiritual solution. Or you can just say, yeah, it's all temporary. It can all fall apart at a moment's notice. Therefore, I got to get it while I can. <laughs> Flaunt it because you're going to lose it. And you don't want to regret that you didn't flaunt it while you have it. <laughs> Get it while you can. That's fear. You're up against the wall. Time is going to get me. i got to get it while I can. You may not think about time, but time doesn't forget you. <laughs> so the intelligent person uses time and temporariness to, to push forward, to push the person forward. A spiritual awakening. And that way time becomes your friend. So these are just a few points I wanted to share with you this evening. Maybe you have some questions. I appreciate that you came out on such, after such a stormy afternoon and evening. I left East Hanover in New Jersey right across the river at 2.30 and Google Maps said, you will arrive at your destination at 3.30 p.m., one hour. So oh, that's reasonable. We didn't arrive until 5.15 p.m. <laughs> Rain, thunder everywhere, and there's an accident on the, on the highway, and on and on and on and on. So I expected that no one would come tonight. But you are the brave ones. You must be very serious. I hope you didn't get drenched. So any questions? Yes. So some people are more for the second version than the first version. Second version being, well, I have to get while I can, um, you know, completely ignorant. So is that because they have their own karmic, um, you know, they have their own karma to be more ignorant? Well, remember the sequence that Queen Kunti explains. Avidja, ignorance. It's an energy. Krishna has various energies, and one of them is the energy of ignorance. So when that interacts with an unfortunate part and parcel of Krishna known as the living entity. You lose all good sense and then you sprout all kinds of artificial desires. And then, as I explained, you execute on those desires. And that's called karma. And you pile up so many reactions for yourself. That's what karma means. So, different bodies, in terms of species of life, produce varying amounts of coverings by ignorance. Human bodies have the advanced consciousness by which we can have a discussion like we're having now. You don't see the grasshoppers here or the rabbits. <laughs> you don't see the cats and dogs here asking a question like you just did. You can ask that kind of question because your human body allows, relatively speaking, generally speaking, a maximum display of consciousness. Think of a lamp. Aha. Look at these lamps here. Lamps, all the bulbs can be the same power, 
but the lampshade, if different, although these are all the same, the lampshade, if different, permits different amounts of light to, man, to shine through, right? So bodies are like that. The human body allows a maximum display of consciousness or a lampshade that permits the maximum amount of light to come through. But other bodies like trees, birds, insects, don't allow that much light of consciousness to come through. So therefore you see activities that are more ignorant. The problem with human beings today is that they're not using their superior consciousness and are acting worse than animals. That is the great problem. Animals don't destroy their own habitat. Animals don't threaten the whole planet with nuclear weapons. Human beings do. Therefore, some say that actually the human species is a virus. <laughs> the huge potential of the human body is unknown to most persons. This human body is meant for reconnecting with Krishna, who is the source of all energy, even the source of ignorance. Why does Krishna have an ignorance energy? Because some living entities want it, and Krishna fulfills all desires. Even if you want to forget Krishna, Krishna arranges for that. Because there can't be love between you, the living entity, and Krishna unless there's free will, freedom. How would you like someone to say to you with a gun in their hand, point at you, come here, love me, be happy? <laughs> would you call that true love? <laughs> so why should Krishna have forced love? So he creates a facility whereby if you want to forget Krishna, there's the cloud of ignorance that you can enter into. So many persons spend years agonizing over this point. Why does Krishna allow us to suffer? Why didn't he stop us? Krishna gives all good advice and we ignore all of it. We're like rebellious children who have to find out the hard way. But you have your choice. Otherwise, it can't be love. So to accept responsibility for our material illusion is a great step forward. Otherwise, we're always whining and crying. Oh, God, why are you doing this to me? To me, of all people. Right? Very good question. Yes. Um, I've, I've had this question for, for a while in my mind. Um, it's, it's sort of going, plays on what you just said, um, uh, which is in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says that when you go to, to where the, his home where he resides in Vaikuntha, you're not to return. Mm -hmm. And our original position is Sachidananda, which is we were eternal. How, there's a fear in my mind of, well, why would we not? Why is that certain if we left in the first place? How, how do, because we were interacted with uh, ignorance. Once burned, twice shy. <laughs> One purpose of material existence is to allow you to try to enjoy separately from Krishna fully and see the disastrous results. So you won't do it again. I'm sure there are things in your life that you've done and you have vowed never again, right? Okay, so there you have it. Anything else? Well, we want to hear from our guests, please. <laughs> Thank you. All right, it's been a pleasure talking with you all. What happens next? Oh. Um, would you like to leave Maharaj? Well, who, do we have a Madanga?
player. station himself or herself. Kirtan is exceedingly important because it, through sound vibration, connects us to Krishna. We're so focused on seeing with the eye but we forget that actually the ear is more powerful. So the Hare Krishna mantra is all about vibrating with the tongue and the sound goes into the ear. And you can experience Krishna in this way. But in this present degraded day and age, everyone is so attached to seeing. They say seeing is believing. But unless you know what you're looking at, seeing will have no value. Surveys have been done of university students and they're stationed in front of a most powerful microscope. And they're told, look through the microscope and tell us what you see. And there's some kind of biological specimen The students are not informed about what they're looking at, so it makes no sense to them what's right in front of their eyes until the professor explains. What you're looking at is actually this and that and that and that. So Krishna can be right before your eyes, but unless you know what you're looking at, you won't recognize Krishna. But we're so confident, so proud, I know what I'm seeing. <laughs> no, without knowledge coming through the ear, you won't recognize what you're looking at. So kirtan is extremely important for bringing about the presence of Krishna through sound.